I know. I Thanks know. for coming to Tea and Tales. Such a big crowd for Tea and Tales. This must be the cheapest thing going on in town. <laughs> uh, this is our sixth tea of the season, and the theme this year has been about transportation. So far, we've looked at all the challenges early residents faced in improving local road conditions. And all of the tales that we've told you have been based on research we did last year for our transportation exhibit, which is just next door. One of the themes in uh, the museum's collection mandate is those who are here first. So one of our panels in the transportation exhibit is about first trails. Uh, to provide accurate information about first trails, however, we needed to rely on some local experts. So we uh, used the local expertise of Johnny Jones and the Little Lot Land and Resource Department, as well as anthropologists Dorothy Kennedy and Randy Bouchard, who generously donated a lot of time to proof our panels and make sure our information was accurate and true. So we're really grateful that Randy and Dorothy could make the trip to Pemberton today. They came over from the island. And they're going to share their knowledge about first trails based on their ethnographic research and the book that they wrote called The Little Lot World of Charlie Matt. They've also brought a collection of these books here to the museum so that we can sell them. So if you can't get one today, we will have a, a slot. For over four decades, including two decades devoted intensively to ethnographic and linguistic field work in First Nations communities, Bouchard and Kennedy have specialized in full-time anthropological and historical research relating to the Aboriginal cultures of BC, Washington, Alberta, the Yukon, and the, and the Yukon. They've co-authored hundreds of reports and publications relating to the ethnography and ethno-history of Aboriginal peoples. We're also grateful for the assistance of Johnny Jones, who's a cultural resource technician with Lilawat Nation and has spent his lifetime walking and studying Lilawat traditional lands. Johnny Jones is a regular contributor to the museum and helps us source hard to find information whenever we request it. So thanks for coming today and thanks to all of you who supported this Team Tail programs this summer. And don't forget to join us next week for our last tale which is called It's a Little Scary in Places and it's about early Highway 99 when it was still a dirt road. My name is Nikki and I'm the curator at the museum. I'll introduce you now to Randy and Dorothy and Joey. Thanks very much, Nikki, for inviting us here today. And thanks to Johnny as well for the invitation. It's really great to be back in Pemberton Valley. We have very fond memories of working here in the 1970s and 1980s with the true experts of this culture, the elders uh, who were alive at that time. Um, most especially uh, Charlie Mack, um, and uh, in 2010 we brought out the book The Deal of World of Charlie Mack, a tribute to this remarkable man, uh, a fabulous storyteller, one of the best we've ever worked with through British Columbia. Um, we are social books, um, so we don't dig. Let's get that straight. <laughs> and so we, we, um, we use uh, ethnographic, linguistic, and ethnohistoric data. And when I say ethnographic, uh, ethnography is a description of a culture. It's based on uh, participation, observation, and interviews with the tradition bearers. Uh, around here it was predominantly Charlie Mack and, and Baptist Ritchie, another remarkable old chief of the area. Um, the uh, linguistic data, uh, we uh, uh, recorded a lot of language material with, with Charlie Mack. Uh, including the place names throughout the area, and through the uh, study of place names, you get to learn about the trails. We've also used ethno-historic data in our reconstruction of the culture, and that is using historical documents and mining them for their insights uh, on the, the human history of an area. Most of the daily transportation in this area was along the waterways of, of this country, you had the Little Wet River, the Birkenhead, Little Wet Lake. And so the, the Diwa people were master canoe makers using the local uh, spruce, um, cedar, cottonwood for their canoes. Uh, this particular canoe was a contract that we got for Charlie Mack from the then called National Museum of Man in Ottawa. 
and uh, in 1975, this was the inaugural uh, voyage of, of the canoe. It's now at the um, Squamish Little Cultural Center at Worcester, if you care to see it. Um, so we also have a master canoe maker with us today. <laughs> so it's great that these traditions are, are carrying on. One of the things that we did with Charlie was to learn how to steam the canoe using hot rocks and, um, and water and rotten salmon heads uh, to season the wood and to make it go uh, more sneakily through the water. Um, and a brief film of that that was photographed in the pouring rain and, and with a, a camera that was malfunctioning. But nevertheless, the film exists and it's on the, the Pemberton Museum website if, and if you care to learn how to steam canoes. Uh, it's quite a delightful film. I mean, there's Charlie, in, you know, in his, uh, his late, in his late 70s at that time making this canoe and he really was a, a master canoe maker. One of the important stories of this area is the story of the copper canoe. And the canoe is the main protagonist. The canoe is a magical, magical craft that could break through rock, uh, help tame monsters, and it was one of the, the spiritual powers that people in the old times used to get. Uh, a man would be out training for, for months, years at times, uh, scrubbing himself with, with boughs, uh, bathing in the water, singing at night, praying for spiritual help. And those who were really lucky were able to pull from the water a copper canoe. That's the root of the copper canoe. Uh, and what we have here is what we're calling topogeny, what, what anthropologists call topogeny. And the story as it is told, the, 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 the um, the man who is training up in the headwaters of the Lillooet River up here, uh, he becomes uh, ill and his brother uh, looks for all types of medicine to cure him. And he finds that by giving him salmon smolt, the man regains his strength. And so he thinks, aha, then I need to take him to the coast where the salmon come from to, to make my brother well. And as he takes him down the river in this magical copper canoe, he tames the, the obstacles in the way. We first uh, tape recorded, uh, in the earlier years, we tape recorded this story with Charlie Mack the first time in 1971. And uh, it was only in the later years, uh, 86, 87, 88, that although Charlie spoke English, he preferred to talk in his own language, Ukomilch. And uh, for the very first time, we started to ask him to retell some of the stories in English, although we had already had them translated. And this story took on a whole different uh, significance uh, to Charlie and to us. And it was particularly, how should I say it, magical, uh, because we had interpreted, we had focused, or we had interpreted the story in 1971 as having something to do with um, a sick person and who, who became a slave, etc., etc. But in fact, this time when he told it, he focused on the copper canoe and the role that this canoe played uh, in uh, uniting all the feeding the monsters uh, in the along the Little Red River Valley and uh, uniting the villages. So it's an extremely important story. We had flown with him in a helicopter in 1988 um, up to the headwaters of the Little Red River. And um, we were going to land and camp there, but that's another story. It's told at the beginning of the book. And uh, we saw for the very first time how, how uh, the, the looks of this incredible place. Yeah. We thank, I don't know who Betty Talbot is, but we sure appreciate the photo which uh, Johnny Jones uh, shared with us. Is he a local, local lady? Or? Yes, she is. Yeah. That's fabulous photograph. And, and this, of course, is it uh, as it looked in 1988. And but um, it 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 really resonated with us. Um, this is where the canoe cut through, and the way they refer to it as being blocked in in their own language. And you can see the cut made by the prow of the canoe. And then it um, he start this this canoe work work its way down the Lillooet River. And by the way, if you have our book, it's on pages. Uh, 18 to 28 of the uh, Charlie Mack book. 
so um, what was going on here was that the person in the copper canoe was taming the country, as Charlie put it, setting things in right for the people who were to follow in the more recent times. And one of the things that he had to battle against was some spats or spits, and it's a type of plant that they, it's a popping cannabinoid, it's an Indian hemp plant. And um, it was supposed to be around here, and it had, they had to get through that, so they did. And then, as Charlie said, they kept it going down the river. And then they had to contend with these are uh, visual representation. He called them mattresses, but in fact, it's Chochatwin in, in, in the language here, and it's, um, it's, the, it's the mats that they make and use to sleep on. And uh, it had to battle through them to keep going further down the river. They're, they're coming out of those holes in the mountainside, mm -hmm. and so they were being attacked by these mattresses. So the copper canoe had to battle the mattresses. But what, what we have here with this ordered set of place names is what we call topogeny. And topogeny is an ordered set of place names um, that is an external projection of memory, of experience. And so when people tell this story, when they're, they're reciting this, this, uh, this travel with the copper canoe, uh, they're linking themselves back to the beginning of time. And so for the Nilwak people, these just aren't, aren't stories of fantasy. These are stories that anchor them to a landscape that was tamed for their use. And so when, when people talk about being part of the landscape, it is because the landscape was created for their use at the beginning of time. Charlie used to say it's not it's not a fairy tale. He'd say, you know, even though it's called that, which sort of is the equivalent of it, he would always say, we're not so, we're not so. Like, it's really, it really was like that. It really was true. Um, so the stories of the Transformers are, are, are actually well known, and, and many people have documented them, not, not just us, but the Dan State, other people who've come through the area. Um, it seemed, uh, it's something like changers is what they tried to call it, the changers, and uh, they traveled through the country, they came up through the Harrison River route, and again I would refer you to what is it, pages 63 to 78, the English version of the, what some of the activities of the Transformers. Uh, they're changing the country, they're, they're making things to tame things down to uh, make certain traits of people that will that will be henceforth uh, happen because of the actions of these transformers. They come up the Birkenhead. They get up to Skumakain, um, which is uh, at the uh, far end of Seton Lake, and then they come back down, and then they get to the Green River and then they go to the Green River up to Squamish and back to the coast. So they, they started from the coast, they came through this area, and they went back to the coast. Um, this is all part of, from Charlie's perspective and from the old people's perspective, part of the story of the uh, beginning of time. That also ties in with the flood story, which we won't get into today, but which is well known and, and also well documented uh, in the book. There's several of them. This particular one, uh, James Tate, the ethnographer who worked in the early 1900s with the ancestors of some of the people here today, um, he made this map, uh, never got published. It was not in his um, what famous 1906 ethnography. But um, he's showing the route here uh, coming through. Uh, I guess it's basically the BGE nowadays, or it used to be called BGE. And the, the point of it is he identified it as the most important trade route uh, between the coast and the interior in this part of the world. It was very, very important. Uh, and for James Tate to say that is really something because his, his knowledge of all the groups was phenomenal. Uh, we'll be coming back to another one of the trade routes, but this is the one that uh, Tate marked in his unpublished notes. 
the things that were traded, and again, we got some information on that, but the, the generations that Tate worked with were born in the mid-1800s, they were able to tell him a little bit more that things that the people here would get from Lillibet included furs, skins, berries, cedar baskets, mountain goat wool. From the coast, they'd get seafood, stentalian shells, yew wood, and from further up the interior, they would get dried salmon and other goods. Now, this is very interesting now. I sent a copy of it along to Tony Jones uh, the other day. Uh, we'll see it in another version where a map historian traced it. But this is the first mapped uh, identification of this country, as far as we know, that has ever been done. Uh, most people had thought that it dated to 1835, but a map historian a few years back in 1887, or 1987, um, determined that in fact it was made by a man named Samuel Black, who was with the Hudson's Bay Company, and it was about 1833. So it's, it's a very, very important map. This is a color copy, and I'll point things out, not so much on this one because you can't see it so well, but the traced copy, the traced copy is much better. There we go. Is there a pointer thing on there? No. Oh. Um, you don't have to stand on your head to read this, but it, it would help because <laughs> the, the map is very weird. It's, it, it's, it's accurate in the sense of its placement of the land features, but it's kind of strange that it's upside down. In other words, north is up there. So to see the lay of the land, you have to, the writing is upside down, but the, the lay of the land is, is correct. So he's talking about this route. He's indicating the route through Seton and Anderson down here, and then over to uh, uh, eventually to Squamish. And He's also uh, showing the route, which we'll be talking about later here, and the Duffy Lake route, which was a native trail as well, that came out down at the, uh, down at the foot of the, the other lake. What's the creek that comes in there? Um, yeah, the Cuyus, yeah. And where it comes out there. And uh, this is the first uh, indication of it on a map, so it's it's pretty important. It's not it's not a well known map. I don't want to bore you with details, but I have to thank Nikki or Nikki Madigan here for piquing my interest several days ago with respect to who was the first person who came through this part of the world. And white person, yes, <laughs> non-native person, right? There was a few others before that. Uh, first contact, quote unquote, as they call it. Um, I'll try to make it brief. It was a man named Francis Hermatinger. You know, I've heard that there's different pronunciations of his name, but people in the Hudson's Bay Archive, where we used to go to get old documents in, they're now in Winnipeg, they called it Hermatinger. But uh, uh, he came here in the August of 1827. He came from uh, Port, but well, became called Port Camelot. It used to be called Thompson's River Post, and uh, the, the route he followed is, is down the lakes there. So he is credited as being the first guy here, but no less a personage than George Simpson, who was the head of the entire Hudson's Bay for North America. Uh, he thought it was somebody else because Hermatinger wrote a report which is lost, which got sent to a man named Archibald MacDonald, so George Simpson credited Archibald MacDonald, so it gets a little bit strange. I think the point is that uh, Simpson is citing um, Hermatinger here, and he says that, and, and George Simpson says in March 1828, there is a country situated in a northwesterly direction from this post, meaning Kamloops, beyond Fraser's River and is occupied by the Lilawat tribe with whom we have just recently become acquainted. 
in fact, it was, he says, it was visited in August 1827 by Chief Trader Archibald MacDonald. Well, uh, it wasn't, it was actually by Ermatinger, but that's all right. He calls it Lillewaite, and it spells it L-I-L-L-E-W-A-I-T-E. So, so he, Simpson himself was mistaken. The Ermatinger, the Ermatinger report is lost. Has said, I mean, I've never seen it either, so we may never know. The, the, as far as we know, the next person who came through here was coming from the other port, which had been established the same year that Ermatinger got through here. Uh, the Port Langley was established uh, down on the Fraser River, river and they uh, investigated the Lillewat River. They called it L I L L E W H I T. They thought it ran all the way down to the Fraser, not realizing about the Harrison and the lakes there, but uh, they sent uh, people up to explore it, and that's reported in the Port Langley journals, which are wonderful documents dating from 1827 to 1830. And both of these documents refer to the lakes, and I, I've never figured out what they're trying to say, they refer to the two lakes, Anderson and Seaton, as what it calls on the Pessile. It's obviously an anglicization of a native term, and I don't know what it is. P E S I L I V E. And another spelling is P I S H A L C O E. I just don't know what it is, but uh, they had identified them by some sort of native designation uh, as early as the uh, 1827. That, that's the first time, and the second time. Uh, as I say, it was uh, in, in actually March of 1830. So, March of 1830, they, they go up the Lillooet River, uh, started from Fort Langley, and in August of 1827, they had come in through uh, the lakes, the uh, Anderson and Seaton. So, as far as the documents say, that is the first contact uh, for this area. Uh, the people, the people from coming up from uh, from Port Langley way up the Little Red River, they got about 20 miles up the Birkenhead, Head, and then they didn't go any, any farther than that. How much time they spent around here isn't documented, but there might be some more reports that we haven't yet seen. This uh, map of 1833 got modified. Uh, Governor James Douglas got a whole copy of it, and in 1861 he added some information to it, and then somebody else added some information in the early 1860s. The point is that this is the only map that we're aware of that actually shows the trail coming through from Stein, up over the Stein, and then down through uh, Lizzie Creek. and that brings us to Dorothy Kennedy, who's going to tell you the about Then there's also the remnant of the Sioux River Trail, I am reminded. We think it is the Sioux River Trail, which is why we have that question mark on it. Not 100% certain. The, the trails that Randy's been describing and that have been documented by some of the early explorers that have gone through here were trails that were in existence. They were native trails that were being used for, for travel, for, for getting resources, um, uh, for visiting one's neighbor, but for, for uh, going to from village to village for societal and ceremonial purposes. But there's one trail, the, the Stein River Trail, that has only been mentioned in terms of warfare. And the Stein River Trail um, is mentioned in a number of stories, I think there's about six or seven versions of the story, that tells of the last battle between the Umschlekatmuk, the, the Thompson River people of the Stein area, and the Nivuat people of the Pemberton Valley. Now in the, in the story, uh, the, uh, some of the Thompson warriors get together over at the Stein and say, oh, let's go and attack the, the Nivuat people, let's get some women and some loot. And so they come over the mountain um, by way of the, the side trail, and they attack the villages down at the, on this side of it. Now, on both sides of the, of the trail, 
Um, we have uh, pit houses, underground houses that the people used to live in, that, are, that have houses connected by tunnels. So it, the archaeological record gives us further support that there was this time of hostility between the two groups and that they were uh, seeking protection with the, the mode of construction of their homes. In the last battle, the chiefs get together, the warriors rather, get together on the, the side river side and say, let's go attack the Livlot, get the salmon, whatever. And they go over and they attack some villages on this side. They burn the houses, um, they take the loot, and the women and, and some children. And they, they head back. Um, they get up, some say it's above Lizzie Lake, some say it's over on the the uh, Stein River side, maybe around what they're now calling Battle Creek, and they camp for the night. And um, they don't bother setting, having any scouts or, or guards because they say, ah, you know, the Liowa people, that's a nation of women, ha ha ha, you know, they're not going to attack. And, uh, and so they're, they're hunkered down in these deep holes in the snow, and they've got a number of them. Uh, and they've got a fire in the snow snow pit, and they've got their women and whatever, um, and they're settled in for the night. But on the other side, in the Pemberton Valley, uh, the people are getting together saying, we want our women back, uh, let's go after them. But, you know, gee, there are the Ipswakatmuk and they're pretty ferocious and, you know, there's lots of snow up there. Uh, the Indian doctors get together and they say, no, you know, we've thought about this, we're dreaming the, what's going to happen and we think you should go after the women. And so the, the warriors from this side go up over the divide and attack while they're in these pits. And it's quite a, a bloody battle. And many, many Shakatmuk warriors are killed. But there's a few, some of the lead warriors, who are, are escaping. And, um, and the, one of the head of the Lilwat um, team says, uh, let it go. He needs to go home and tell the people what's happened here and that we shouldn't be fighting anymore. Um, and then there's, uh, but there's a number of them left and so they see one fellow, one Shikapa warrior dressed in his armor and they say shoot him, shoot him and the arrows are being be deflected by this ironwood armor. And so uh, finally someone says shoot him in the throat, shoot him in the throat. So they shoot this warrior in the throat and of course he dies. And then the other one or two were sent home to tell the tale. Um, so that's the the story. Um, it's great that we have the armor that's now in the American Museum of Natural History to to tell the story. But really, we don't know the the whereabouts of this trail. Uh, when John Hill went through in 1860. He got up uh, uh, into the timber line on the other side of the sign, and the trail disappeared. At that time, the, the wars, the hostility was now over, and the trail was no longer in use. Um, the, um, the expedition um, then sort of made their way over the, over the divide and came down Lizzie Creek. Now, Charlie Mack told us that the Lizzie Creek route down to the lake was the one that people took. And, and, and people from the new uh, were going up there and trapping and whatnot. Um, but this is, this is a case where the, the route is uncertain because this war story occurred about 1830. Now we're able to date that because people like Charlie Mack knew the names of the warriors involved. And so using the genealogical reconstruction, we were able to determine that this, this hostility was happening in the 1830s. And also, uh, on the, in the uh, Thompson, the Hikapnik version of the story, they say that the chief was Spitlin, and we know uh, when he was born, when he died, um, he occurs uh, a lot in the historical record. So we have fairly clear dating of when this hostility occurred. But this is, this, the Stein River Trail is one, one trail that is always associated with war. The Transformer went through the country, as Randy mentioned, and one of the places where they left their footprint was at uh, Birkin, at the divide between the, the Seton Lake and the Pemberton Valley, where there's the, the height of land. 
And there was this big boulder here. Um, now, A.C. Anderson went through here in 1846 when he was looking for a route and had some native guides. And they pointed out this big boulder to him. And here's little uh, Charlie Mack and Baptist Ritchie in front of this big boulder. And Anderson wrote in, in 1846, he said, at height of land where there is a large isolated block of granite bearing an impression closely resembling that of a human foot. The Indians call it the footstone and have, of course, a marvelous tradition connected with it. And, of course, that is the, the story and the marvelous tradition is the, the tale of the Transformer. We call it Skwach, which means foot. footprint. Now, in 1860, there was also an exploration through Duffy Lake by Stafford John Duffy of the Royal Engineers. And, and Duffy was sent by Douglas to examine this route that the Native people were using to see if it might be a good way for supplies to come into the interior. And so he was very uh, meticulous in documenting um, both his camps and the Native camps he encountered. And here he is uh, coming up, you know, Indian camp at this area where he camps and then um, uh, blow down creek there and, and where another trail is coming through. Um, but importantly, when he gets near Duffy Lake, he, he also talks about another Indian camp and then he talks about another footprint. And Duffy in his, um, um, in his notes, he says, um, guide pointed out a rock. Indian tr tradition says Sahabi Tai, using the, the Chinook term uh, boss above or chief or god. Um, god once stepped from a rock near Summit Lake, Birkin, where we just saw the other rock, over the mountains and rested on this rock. There is a footprint of a rock two miles from the halfway house and near Summit Lake at Birkin. I saw it myself. Well, we too knew the rock existed because Charlie Mack had told us the, the story and, and um, had, you know, one sign said, you know, it's down there, it's down there, and we never, you know, took the time and, and stopped to look for it. Uh, so we never knew. Well, we stopped, but we couldn't find it. Yeah, yeah, so. we couldn't find it. Um, so instead, we, um, we've sent the, um, the Duffy notes, uh, field notes, and uh, a report that we did uh, with information from Charlie Mack to Johnny Jones, and Johnny went looking for the footprint. And he'll now tell us about his search. And here is the aerial photo. Thank you, Dorothy. Well, it was a pleasure to uh, work with uh, Randy and Dorothy on uh, a lot of these uh, trails and stuff and um, I actually uh, went out in my own time with my GPS and all these notes and papers went out trucking around jumping off the road here and there GPS and checking it out and, and I found uh, the footprint and the footprint is uh, half under the highway uh, right here it's half under the highway there and uh, I was looking like all over the place here, checking out, jumping down. I'd find different camps here and there. And then I found another drying rack frame, great, great, not too far from it. And this one creek here that always shows up uh, in the Safford Duffy uh, map of 1860. And uh, so uh, from that creek, I GPSed up above there. Then I walked back down, and that's when I, I found uh, the footprint there. And I've been like dealing with a lot of the old uh, maps and photos and stuff and uh, following the trails and war trails and hunting trails, trap line trails and the old uh, pioneers trails and uh, maps and and uh, when Dorothy was talking about the Stein Valley uh, battles there uh, and uh, the last battle was in 1850 and I actually know where that creek was and where all the arrows were stuck in the trees there and where all the bones were and that's, uh, my dad told me that I've uh, heard the bone so my mentor was my dad, uh, uh, you know, getting me out into the land there 
And uh, that's how I was brought up, was just the knowledge from our elders and, you know, avoiding uh, the Catholic schools and churches that run away from that and go into the mountains. And my schooling was in the mountains, so that was, that was uh, very important to, to me to, to know who I was and where I came from because my grandfather was a cupman, uh, August Hunter from Skookumchuk, and uh, he died at only 25 years old. And when I was 11 years old, uh, he drew me a map, and that was just like six months before he passed away. So I still have this uh, hand-drawn map from him, from Cupman. And uh, he had a lot of, you know, like lines, symbols, and lakes in there, and I had to understand all that. and, and uh, I had to go out to, to Washington and you know, it's uh, up in Glacier Lake there, across Cookham Chuck there, and uh, my uncle KK when he was alive took me up there and to Washington. And uh, that was uh, important uh, to find these things. It's it's in me to, to search these things and probably, you know, to, I guess, to get the real truth uh, out in, you know, so other people can be educated and know about them. Thank you. This Duffy Lake Trail was very significant to the people here. Um, up, uh, I mean, through this area where the footprint is, up towards Duffy Lake, were what we call regulated hunting areas. And the form of regulation um, was that there were headmen assigned to different hunting areas. And this allowed the people to manage how many game were being taken from particular areas. For to go into a hunting area, one had to have permission from the person who was the, the manager of the game of that area. Uh, so people were just hunting, you know, hither and hither. It's, uh, you know, these are, are prime mountain goat and deer hunting areas, and uh, they were managed um, for their, uh, for the game. Um, Johnny also mentioned uh, the root digging rack, or we think it's a root digging rack that he's found. Um, and this also was an area where people were getting the yellow avalanche lily and the western spring and beauty uh, bulbs, uh, both uh, important sources of, of carbohydrates for the people. Um, so we are left with a footprint on the Burkitt Divide and another near Duffy Lake. Of course, we, we don't know conclusively that, that this is the one, but gosh, when you compare the two, they certainly look very similar. And uh, it's striking. It is striking. So well done, Johnny, in finding that. So let's pop back to this Tate, this Tate map for a minute. It's talked about in the Charlie Mac book about traveling on glaciers and um, Years ago, was it a young, a young man attempted to, uh, in fact, did emulate the trip across the glaciers? Uh, he ended up here, didn't he? He started over, started over in the Forest Paul River, and ended up here. Were you here then when that happened? I don't know who was here when that young man did that, but he he did the reverse of the trip from uh, what the old timers uh, told us about. Oh yeah, I, I remember he, he dropped by our office there and yeah. shook his hand. And, yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, it was, it was quite amazing. Yeah. So, then, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> when James Tate had this uh, <coughs> showing roots, this is another route that he's showing. And this is a route that goes over the glacier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's better. <laughs> goes over the glacier, as they call it, quite, quite up at the head of the um, Lillooet River and crosses over and comes out at the head of uh, Jarvis Inlet. That too was a trade route. <coughs> and that uh, route, I think, contributed to the fact that at one time, and this is told to us both by the old timers from here and by the old timers from Seashell, uh, explained why at one time the people from a, a place called Hanechen that's in the seashell uh, language, uh, were completely bilingual in seashell and in this language spoken here. And this was until relatively recent times, like maybe 50 or, no, not 50, but... 1858? Yeah, yeah relatively, relatively recent compared to thousands of years ago. But 
it was a it was a bilingual community. Um, we got a couple of photographs of people who, for fun, go and ski across glaciers and mountains in the middle of winter or at any other time, and uh, they sent us they shared some photographs with us, and we have them in the in the uh, Charlie Mack book. Uh, Charlie talked about this and was able to name people that he knew, people from here who had who had gone uh, across there. And what did we date to the early 1900s? The early 1900s. Yeah. Again, Charlie was able to name the people um, who were going back and forth, and they were, were going over um, uh, in the in the late spring sometimes, uh, sailing through the fishing season at Seashell, and then. Uh, whole families would be doing this, and then they would come back in the fall in time for, for the hunting. Uh, and they would be packing large bales of, of salmon on their back across the, across up the route through Hunnichen and across the, the Lua Glacier. And I, I must say, when Charlie first told us about this, we thought, oh yeah, right, you know, people walking across glaciers, and then, you know, the more and more stories we heard, and then we, uh, you know, and then we actually thought about it and, and uh, took a, a hard look at the stories and realized that, yes, indeed, these people are quite incredible. And a few of the old timers from Seashell also knew from their uh, ancestry that they were back and forth uh, connections, so yeah. uh, it, was, it was confirmed. But one of the most amazing things about it is something called ice worms. Mm -hmm. And that's for real. And we had no idea. Charlie talked about the fact that uh, a uh, very famous guy called, I think it was the Kipke, uh, Hunter Jack, uh, partly from here in relation to Baptist Ritchie, and that one time when he was going across there, he talked about, what did he say, uh, uh, how did he describe those ice worms? Well, like a heavy snowstorm. Oh, yeah, a yeah. snowstorm. And yeah. they are for real. And the, the delightful thing about it, that Charlie had long since passed away, but his Bible in English knowledge, his Bible in English knowledge was a, a thing called Alaska Magazine. And uh, it turns out that Alaska Magazine had a article about these creatures, and they are for real. But they can only live at certain temperatures, and they melt. Mm -hmm. and well, they, 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 live, they live on the algae. And bacteria in the ice. And, Has um, anyone heard of them? We, we never did. When oh, so, oh uh, local people know about that. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. blew us away. And so, in Hunter Jack's story, he says he, he walked over up to the glacier and it was nice and sunny and he stopped to rest and he put his back against a uh, rock. Um, and then the, some clouds came and, and it became very shady. And suddenly he looked about him and it was like, uh, heavy, heavy as a snowstorm. It was just covered in these worms. And that's because um, they can live between um, uh, 25 degrees and 41 degrees when it's shady. As soon as the sun comes up and, and the temperature raises, the ice worms melt. And so there's a lot of ice so worms times, right now. At times, you can have as many as um, 2,000 ice worms per square meter. So that's a lot of ice worms. And so, you know, you can see why, you know, Hunter Jack said he just kept on walking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, still on the subject of trails, there's another uh, type of trail. Uh, this is a trail of the imagination. And it's tied in with, and it's again in the, in the Charlie Mack book, it's a trail about a person, it's, it's a cat's cradle game or string game, which we are told by the authorities is probably one of the most widely known games of all cultures in the world, so they say. And Charlie, of course, knew it. And in 1972, we managed to, to arrange for a person to come out from Ottawa to film him uh, telling this particular story. Is it the sound of it is on here? Uh, anyway, he, he, he's, he's, talking about going, he's talking about going up the Little Red River in a canoe, which he shows it on the string game, and, and 
he shows, uh, and then he says that there's some women there, and so they calls out to them and says, come on with us, we're going up the river to Eiloa. Again, no such of a place, but they're all going there. So I say these are places of the imagination, and that's all part of it, is that there is no such place. And so one of them says, well, I'll go too. And then he points out, look at this woman here, she's got some wild rose hips. And then the others say, oh, no, don't touch them, they're no good for your system. They go as far as one someone says, look at that woman, she's got high bush cranberries. Don't touch them, you'll get diarrhea, and so on. And as he is telling the story, you can see that him working it so that the canoe is going along, and one person is added to it, and another person, and it's quite, it's quite magical, but we can't see it. If you like, we could put it online with this talk. With the video, with the video. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that would work better. But uh, I think that's more or less where we stop, isn't it? Um, the museum is selling copies of the The Blue Well World of Dry Mac. Here's what, what we want you to um, take away from today is that despite the high mountains here, the isolation of these people, they weren't really isolated at all. They had these trails that they used for many purposes, um, going in all directions. And it's through the, the use of ethnographic and ethnohistorical research and through that type of data that we're able to now pull this information together and um, have people like Johnny out there looking for the remains of these trails. Okay, so thank you very much. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer.